All right. Now in John chapter 21, of course, this is the last chapter. We saw the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the past couple chapters. And if you remember in the last chapter, we, it was the resurrection and, and he had been seen by his disciples a few times throughout the day. And Thomas was unbelieving and, and Jesus just proved without a doubt that he was risen from the dead. Now, um, we start off here in chapter 21. Look down at verse number one. It says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. So, this is after that first day. He, just, he shows himself again. Verse number two says, There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Now this is not something that we need to look over because they had seen the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, this is after that. They knew he rose again from the dead. Yet here we see Peter saying, Hey guys, I'm going to go out fishing. What's he doing? He's returning essentially back to his secular work that he did when Jesus first met him. If you remember, flip back, keep your finger here in John 21. We're going to look back to Luke chapter number 5. Back when Jesus was calling his disciples to follow him. If you remember, Peter, James, and John were all fishermen. And he actually meets them like, like on the boat and, he's, and he tells them to follow him. And look at Luke chapter number 5. We're going to look at this verse. We're going to go back to, to see what Jesus actually said to him. Because this, what, what Peter's doing here, there's a, you know, Peter has a, has a big focus in this chapter. There's a lot of, of, this, of this chapter as an emphasis on, on Peter and Jesus' interaction with Peter. Um, because it's important. We can't, we can't look over this or skip over this. Luke chapter 5, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. This is when Jesus was telling them to follow me. And he says specifically in this verse, in verse 10, to Simon, he's talking to Simon Peter. And he says, Fear not, from this day forward. That's what henceforth means. He says, from now on, from here on out, you're going to catch men. And they forsook their jobs. They forsook the fishing. They forsook their boats. They forsook their nets. They left them behind. They didn't even say, well, wait, wait, let me sell off all this stuff and get all the money for it. They just left. When Jesus called them, they responded to that calling immediately. And you get that from the other gospel. I went over that in other sermons, how they just immediately dropped everything. And they're like, okay, well, we'll just follow you now. And Jesus took care of them, right? I mean, for the three and a half years that they were with him, they were following around and being part of his ministry. They didn't lack anything. Jesus took perfect care of them. We get to the point now at the end of Jesus' ministry where he dies and he rises again from the dead. He's seen of his disciples that very, that very day he rose. He shows himself openly, and it's amazing, and it's wonderful, and it's got to be an extremely joyful time. But now we see how quickly people can forget and how quickly we can get sidetracked with just the cares of this world. Jesus told him, look, from here on out, you're not going to catch men. He didn't mean until I die and rise again, and then you're just going to go back to, to being a fisherman. But that's what Peter did. Jesus was gone. He rose again from the dead. Now he's thinking, okay, well, now what do we do? Well, I'm just going to go fishing. Instead of going fishing for men with his time, he says, yeah, you know what, I'm going to go. And look what happens. Anytime people get into sin and get away from serving God, it's easy to draw other people with you. And we all have to look out for this. You don't want to be the Peter that, that decides to just give up serving God, basically, and just say, okay, well, I'm just going to go back into the world. I'm just going to go back to my old job. And yeah, it was fun. I served with Jesus. Now I'm going to go back to what I did before. No, you got to, you know, once you put your hand on the pl to the plow, there's no looking back. We should, we, you know, we're not worthy of him. That's what the Bible says. He that putteth his hand to the plow and looketh back. 
when you get started working for, for God, when you start working for Jesus, that's your full-time job, and you need to just keep on doing that. Um, and this is, you know, in Peter's case specifically, he told him, look, from here on out, you're going to be catching men, not fish, Peter. But he goes back, and that's what it says when he saith unto them, in verse 3, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing, they say unto him, we also go with thee. So they all went out. But notice it's interesting because it says that that night they caught nothing. Now here's a, the difference between a child of God and someone who's not a child of God. You know, once you get saved and you become God's child, things change in your life. And God treats you differently. You can look at the world and say, you know, this world's so wicked. You look at the movie stars and people that have all this wealth. And you look at these unsaved people and they seem to be succeeding in this world. Right? They, they, they are conducting business and things are just going great for them and they're amassing all of this wealth. And you're saying, but I'm a Christian. You know, I'm a son of God. Why am I not, you know, experiencing all this wealth? And, and why is not, you know, everything that I do isn't just being blessed as it appears to be with these other people who are really wicked? But that's on purpose. See, God doesn't want you focused on the riches and the material possessions of this world. And I'll tell you what, when you decide to just, to just get away from God and just be like, well, I don't really feel like serving God anymore. I'm going to go off and do this other thing, whether it be fishing or you know, doing this other work. He's, gonna, he's not going to bless you for that. And he can make sure that, okay, you don't want to serve me? Well, guess what? You're not going to catch anything either. I'm not going to bless your business for sure. Now, on one hand, you know, you could have, and look, you could have Christians that, that are wealthy and that make some money and find, you know, Abraham was pretty wealthy. You could look at Jacob, you look at Israel, you know, they had, they had accumulated some wealth and they were saved and they were godly men. There's nothing wrong with just inherently having money, but that shouldn't be your focus. And if that's going to drive you away from serving God, God can very easily make sure that, guess what? If that's what you're going to be spending your time on focusing on, I can make sure that that, that is not going to produce for you at all. Because he's your son. Because he wants you coming back and following him. Which is exactly what he's explaining to Peter over and over again throughout this chapter. When he, said, when he asks him, do you love me more than these? Hey, look, feed my sheep. And then, and then Peter's still concerned with other people when he asks about, about the apostle John. And he's saying, look, that's none of your business. You follow me. That's what you need to be doing. He told Peter already from the beginning you need to be following me. When we get off track from serving God, God is not going to just bless whatever we're doing. You know, if you say, let's say uh, 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 an easy example, you know, you, you're coming to church faithfully and you decide church is important and you're coming and you start coming to all the service you hear. Then after a while, you're like, yeah, you know what? I've been going to church for so long and and I know it's important, but I'm just going to start skipping church because there's this baseball game on TV or there's a football game or whatever. And, you know, I've already done that for, for a long enough time and, and, and I served God. Now I'm just going to have some me time. I'm going to go out and do what I want to do. God will make sure as a child of God that you are not going to be blessed. That's not going to bring you joy. It's not going to bring you happiness. He's not going to bless what you're doing if you decide to just start getting away, start backsliding and getting away from doing the things of God. And that's exactly what we see is happening here with Peter. But what the dangerous part about that is you're able to bring people with you then too, as Peter did. And we need to all be, be careful about this, that we don't get sucked in with someone else's backsliding, with someone else's sin. Because it's an easy thing to do. We look up to each other oftentimes. You look up and say, hey, there's Pastor Burzins. He's a great Christian. Hey, there's Brother Anderson. Hey, there's Brother Sebastian. Hey, there's, you know, there's these, all these different people you can look up to and say, you know, I know that they're a good Christian. When they start backsliding and do other things, you, you start to, to, in your brain, think that like, oh, well, if he's doing it, it must not be that bad. You know, I know they're, they're a good Christian. Because this is the way we look at people. You say, well, I know that this person's a, a good Christian and... If they're doing it, they must have already thought about it and it can't be that bad. And then that, gets, that opens up the door for you to start doing the same thing. And you need to be on guard about that because it's great to have good examples. It's great to look at people and say, hey, here's a good godly man. And, and look at the good attributes that they have and see how are they serving God and, and try to mimic that. You know, as the Apostle Paul said, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. 
And, and there's nothing wrong with looking to people as examples for that, but you always have to be careful that we maintain this as the ultimate authority and standard for our life. And if someone else starts backsliding, if someone else starts to get into sin, don't get sucked in along with them and just say, okay, well, if you want to go fishing, Peter, go ahead. I'm going to go out and go knock some doors and go fish for men. And it's important for someone like Peter to hear that too, for you to be strong in the face of that. Because if, if John or James might have said to him, no, no, Peter, like, you know what? If you want to do that, fine, but we're going to go catch men. Maybe Peter would have changed his attitude right away instead of everyone else just going along and following Peter's lead. It might have only taken one person to just say something different to then just gotten all of their mind, their heads back on straight. So don't ever just be a blind follower of anybody, even if it's the Apostle Peter. Peter was a great man of God. He was a good leader. He was someone who took initiative. He was someone that was able to, to get people to follow him. I mean, he had this ability. He was, he was a, and he was a, a righteous man, but he, he made mistakes. And ultimately, he was human and he sinned too. So don't ever put anybody up on that pedestal to where, well, if this person is doing it, then it must be okay. You need to determine what's right and wrong for yourself based on what Scripture says. And don't just rely. And look, I understand it's an easy thing to do because we have a natural tendency to not want to put in as much of the effort in making those decisions for ourselves and relying on somebody else to do it for us. That's why we live in a nation of sheeple today. People who just listen to whatever the news is feeding them, listen to whatever anybody is just telling them because they don't want to do the research for themselves. They're just going to say, oh yeah, they must have done the research. They must have figured it out for themselves. They must have read the Bible and studied this out and figured that that's okay. So I'm going to do it too because they're doing it and they must have done it. And why would they ever steer me wrong? It's a very dangerous attitude to have. Works okay if the person you're following is doing right. But as soon as they, they fall off the mark, you're going to go right with them. And it's, you, we need to be vigilant for our own selves individually. And again, I mean, you, you don't know the impact you might have on somebody else. All, if, if one person might have just said something different and said, you know what, no, you know, Jesus told us, you know, not, we're not going to be fishermen anymore. We will fish for men. This is, this is what we're going to do. And you could have a serious impact. And remember that individually, you can have a, a very good impact especially with, with another brother in Christ, another sister in Christ, starts to backside and you, maybe you notice that about them. You know, hopefully we get to know each other pretty well around here in this church and talk about things that we do and if you start to just notice someone backsliding a little bit, maybe you could give them that extra encouragement. That's what church is for. You know, one of the reasons is here to edify others. You notice someone maybe starting to slip, maybe starting to backslide a little bit from where they were. You can, instead of joining them, Say something that can hit home in a loving way and just maybe push them right back from, from back, so pull them back a little bit from, from sliding back too far. Um, sometimes it doesn't take much. But when you love someone, that's what, that's what we ought to do. And don't let your flesh pull you with them and say, oh, okay, and, and justify it. This, this justification is, is what everybody does when we get into sin, is just you justify it somehow in your head. Don't ever let another person's sin be your justification to follow that person into sin. Let's keep reading here. Verse number four, it says, but when morning, keep your finger if you have not in, in, in Luke 5. We're going to go going right back there because I want to show another um, example here, but I'm going to keep reading in John 21. John 21, verse number four says, but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself in the sea. So we see him out. They're out there. They're up all night. They didn't catch anything. Jesus is on the shore. They don't know who it is. And he's just saying, hey, you guys caught anything yet? Are you having any luck? And they answer him back and they say, no. And he says, cast the net on the other side. 
You know, it's kind of funny because you think like if I were in that situation, I'd be like, who's this guy? You know, like what, <laughs> what are you telling me to cast a net? You know, we've been out here all night. What do you think? But they do it. You know, they listen to say, okay, we'll cast a net. And then when they realize they get this huge bounty of fish, I mean, they just, the, the net just fills up. They think back and they realize, John's like, this is, this is Jesus. Like, that's the Lord. And the reason why, if you flip back to Luke 5, keep your finger here in John, from that same story in Luke 5, look at verse number 4. This, this same, almost the same exact scenario had happened, again, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry when he called them to be his disciples. Luke 5, 4 says, Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night. Sound familiar? We have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when he had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Now, in this story, we see Jesus tells them to let down the nets, plural. He says, let them down, let down the nets. He says, okay, I'll let down the net. So he, he only lets one down. And Jesus was right. He said, let down the nets because he knew how many fish there were going to be. So when he only lets down one net, it breaks because it wasn't able to hold all of the fish that, that were there that Jesus was telling them to do. But this is the same exact story repeated. Jesus is dry. I mean, it's, it's amazing the way that God works. Isn't it? I mean, they're, they're, they're starting to backside. They're starting to get away from him. Jesus shows up. And it hits home in such a way that, that is just is no, nothing short of amazing. The same way that their ministry started. And he, he said, look, you need to follow me. It started with these events. With, with them, you know, fishing and toiling all night, not getting anything. Him telling them to lay down the net. They, they pull up this bounty. And then he tells them that you're going to catch men, not fish. And at the very end of his ministry here, when after he's resurrected from the dead, they go back to fishing, the same exact story plays out. And this time he tells them to let down the net. And they listen and they do. They let down the net and the net didn't break. When you listen to Jesus, it's exactly right. I mean, he's, it says for all the fish that they caught, yet the net still didn't break. And they had a huge bounty, but that because he said to let down the net and they listened to him, they obeyed what he said to do. It was enough. It was sufficient. And there's so, there's, there's so much to learn and there's so much sim symbolism in this last chapter here. Um, it's kind of cool. And it's a lot of fun. But I don't think we're going to get to everything. But still, um, Jesus Christ lets them, tells them to cast on that. When you're obeying Jesus' command, He will take care of you no matter what. And what's really interesting is here is that um, you know nothing in the Bible is accidental. If you ever remember about a week or two ago, I mentioned something um, that said, I don't understand why this is in the Bible. I don't know why. Um, but look at what we see here because nothing is here by accident. This one I have a much better grasp on in the, the, the second half of verse 7 when John recognizes these miracles and he says, okay, this happened to us before. That has got to be Jesus on the shore that's doing this. And he says at the second half of verse 7, he says, Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. So it doesn't just throw that part in there for no reason. It explains to us when, when Peter was in the boat, he was naked. Okay, and Nakedness in the Bible is always referred to as like, um, is always correlated with being shamed and being shameful. You have to cover up your nakedness so that you don't expose you know, your, your, your nakedness because when, you, when your nakedness is exposed, you are ashamed. And you ought to be ashamed. And it's, it oftentimes refers to, you know, when people get into sin, then their, their nakedness is exposed. And Peter was in sin here. He was doing what he shouldn't have been doing. He went back to the world, back to his old job, and he was naked. Now, this is, a, this is heavily symbolic, but it tells us, it explains to us, I mean, he was just, just openly in shame and nakedness on this boat, doing what he shouldn't have been doing. But when Jesus calls, he covers himself up and he swims right to shore. And no matter where you're at, when you backslide, you need to be able to cover yourself back up 
and don't wallow in that shame. Don't, don't be like, oh man, I let Jesus down. Now there's, there's nothing I can do. You know, there's nothing I can do about it. I've already let him down. I'm a failure. I've already backslid. So I might as well just keep on doing it. That is a defeated attitude. And that's one that's going to keep you out of church. And that could keep you out of serving God for the rest of your life. Unless you're careful about it. You need to be humble. In all cases, be humble. And you say, well, wait, I, you know, I am humble when I'm, when I'm ashamed of what I've done. You need to be humble enough to then crawl on your knees back and just come back to Jesus because he can still use you. And look, I mean, Peter was used in a great way after these events. We already saw he failed Jesus when he denied him three times. Right? He wept bitterly about that. He's failing Jesus again when he decides to just go out fishing and just go out and doing this other stuff. Yet he still comes back and he's still able to be used. You know, you may fall down seven times, but you need to pick yourself back up again and get back in the fight. Um, because the only way that you are ever going to fail in this lifetime is just to give up and to quit. And just to say, you know what? I'm defeated. I'm done. Then you fail. But just because you backslide, that doesn't mean it's automatic failure. Just because you get away from God for a little while. And look, I'm not trying to make light of it either. We ought not to ever backslide. But it does happen. And if you find yourself in this situation, you need to get back and girt yourself back up and, and head back towards Jesus. Jesus was far away from him. He was on the shore. They were all out in the middle, not in the middle, but, but out in the, in the water away from him. But as soon as they found out that he was there, he, uh, he swims right to him. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 8 says, And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. So, Jesus already had fish. He already had bread. And he was already there cooking it up and ready to provide for them. They didn't need to go out and do this under their own strength and under their own power. And when they were under their own strength, it wasn't blessed. They didn't catch anything. When Jesus decided to bless them, then all of a sudden they have this great bounty and, you know, and they have all this fish. Just proving we need to be reliant on God, on Jesus, more than on ourselves. Don't get this mindset of thinking that you have to do things under your own power. Look, if you're following and serving God, and I believe this for everybody, okay? You could say, well, you're the pastor, you're supposed to be serving God, and you, know, and you have your faith in God that He'll take care of you. Don't worry about your work, Pastor Burson. Don't worry about this other stuff, because God will take care of you, because that's your job. You need to be serving God. Well, no, that's all of our jobs. We all need to have that type of a faith. It's not just for the pastor. It's not just for, for any you know, one person or one man. It's for all of us as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ. If you want to follow him and serve him, he will take care of you. You don't have to be the pastor of the church for him to take care of you. It doesn't matter where you're at, whatever situation you're in. If you decide to follow him, he can provide for you. He was already on the shore with, with the food that they needed, with the sustenance that they needed to get by. If they would have just stayed with him, they wouldn't have even had to go out into the boat necessarily. You know, they, they, he could provide for what you're doing. And look, I'm not saying that you don't ever need to work or something. Don't take it the wrong way. But when you have the faith in Christ and you're doing what he tells you to do and not going out and doing what he told you not to do, you know, when he says, look, from now on, you're going to be doing this, you're not going to be doing that, you listen to him. And... Sometimes it takes a lot of faith to, to do that and to, and to obey and to follow, but we need to have that faith. Don't, don't have that lapse in faith because he is able to provide. As we see here, he was perfectly, he already had this stuff. And he was sitting there waiting for them when they came back. And um, it says in verse 10, Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes. And 150 and three, that's a lot of fish. 153, it says great fishes. They're big. It's not like they had little bluegill or little minnows in there. I mean, he had 153 great fish in that net. And it says, um, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus made sure when he told him to let down the net, he knew what, what, it, was able, what it was capable of doing. And, and it was able to uh, maintain that many and still not be able to break. Verse number 12, Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him. That means they didn't dare to ask him, Who art thou? 
knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, it's interesting here because if you remember, when Peter denied Jesus, how many times did he deny him? He said three times, right? Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Three times he was in denial to Christ. Three times now we see Jesus asking him, Do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And we see, we see the powerful actions that Jesus has taken to get through to his disciples. He gets through to them in, this, in the, the part we just read with the, the similarities, with the same exact thing, withdrawing the net and getting their attention that way. And then we see here with, with Peter. This had to have rung home, if not right then, later on, Saying, man, I denied Jesus three times, and now he had to come back and ask me three times, do I really love him? You know, do I love him? And, um, but he did, and, and, and you know, this is how Jesus dealt with him. But there's another aspect of this that, that I want to I wanna touch on with this story. Because there's a lot of pastors out there, and a lot of preachers, that, and some of them are good guys, you know, they're saved or whatever, they're, you know, but they get caught up into this, going back to the Greek to really understand more about what we're, what we're learning and what we're getting from the Bible and say, you know what? Yeah, you could read the Bible, but I'll tell you what, when you go back to the Greek, you get all this extra meaning and this hidden knowledge and all this other stuff. Don't buy into it. Okay, you don't need that. God is fully capable of giving us His Word in any language He chooses, in every language that exists, He's able to give us His words with the full meaning and comprehension that we need from His word. And what people will do oftentimes, and, it, and I would guess a lot of times preachers like doing this. Sometimes, I mean, they've, they've, I know that there's got to be some honest people out there saying, you know what, they think they've learned something neat or special and they're going to share that with people. But what ends up happening is you don't know Greek. And then they say, well, I do. And I'll tell you what this really means. And when they start doing that, now all of a sudden you need to rely on the preacher man to tell you what the Bible means because you don't really understand this. And this is what they used to do in, in, you know, in Catholic churches. They would just have whole masses and Latin and all this other stuff. And it's like, you know, people don't even speak that language. They don't even understand what they're saying. Well, you just need to rely, just do what I say because I know this stuff and you don't. And when people start listening to um, a pastor that says, oh, but in the Greek it says this and this is what it really means. Even inadvertently, what they're doing is casting doubt onto what you're reading in English. You say, well... Can I not really get that from the English reading? Now, some preachers that'll do this, they'll say, oh, and in the Greek it means this. They basically say exactly what the definition of the word is, which you don't need to tell you the definition of the word in Greek because that's exactly what it means in English too. So thanks a lot for telling me that, buddy. But sometimes what they'll do though is they'll try to make up these extra doctrines. And it's real dangerous because you get people who, they don't know the language. They'll just go to a lexicon, they'll go to some dictionary, and that'll be their authority on what these Greek words mean. So they'll have, you know, the Strong's Dictionary and Strong's Concordance. And I'm not saying it's inherently bad to have those things. But what I am saying is that if you're going to rely on the definition that some man makes up for a language that you don't know to help you to understand God's word, now you're going to be treading in serious waters because it's, that's going to lead you into false doctrine. And one of the false doctrines that we get is in this passage where, and 
this is very pervasive. This is, this is a very common thing that's been taught of uh, the difference in the word love. So in the English language, we have the word love, right? In Greek, they have a couple of different words for the word love. They've got agape, they've got phileo, and, and if I'm not pronouncing it right, it's because I don't speak Greek, okay? So forgive me if I'm not saying these words right. I don't, I'll, I'll be the first one to admit, I don't speak Greek. But I do know the Bible. I do know the Bible in English. And I do know that God has preserved this for us today and that we don't need any other language. We don't need to learn a special language. God didn't say, well, you need, the only way you're going to be able to understand my word completely is to learn Hebrew and Greek. That's not the way he operates. But what they'll say, and you could, and I'm going to prove this wrong directly from the Bible. And Again, it happens when people aren't diligent enough and they're just easy to accept whatever they hear and not do the homework for themselves. And I've done homework on this for myself. Every sermon I preach, I do homework for you because I want to make sure that what I'm saying is true. Even if it's stuff that I've heard from people that I know and I love and I trust. When I hear things that other people say, my former pastor, I love him. I think he preaches the truth. I, I, you know, I've learned a lot from him, but I don't take everything that he says just because he said it. I just don't assume it to be true. I need to find out for myself whether these things be so. And you need to be doing the same things. Just because you know, oh, Pastor Burzins, he does a lot of homework for his sermons and he, he's making sure that this stuff is right. Don't rely on me to do that. I mean, I, I'm not steering you wrong, but at the same time, you know, just because I say it doesn't mean you should just receive it automatically without any hesitation or, or speculation. You know, receive it for what it is, for my work, and then do it yourself. You know, if, if what I'm saying lines up, matches up, great, you know, but, but don't just assume that it's, all, that it's automatically true. Okay, you could, you could uh, everyone can do... Um, the research that I have done on these different things. So what they say, and, and here's, what, here's what gets preached. When uh, Jesus asks, because he asked Peter three times, do you love me? So the first two times in the Greek, it uses this word agape. Okay? But then the third time, it uses this word phileo. And what they say is that, well, the agape is really like a much lesser type of a love, kind of like a friendship love, like not as, as strong. But that phileo that's like a really um, intense, like a, like a really strong type of a love is what they'll say. So the first two times, he's kind of using this agape, like, oh, do you love me? Do you love me? But then the third time, he, he uses that word phileo, and that really hits Peter, and that's why he's so sorry and, and grieved that Jesus even used, you know, now he used this word phileo. Because when Peter answers him, he uses that word phileo every time. But then when, when Jesus asks the third time, it's that word phileo. And in English, it only says love, so we don't get to know, these, you know this special hidden meaning behind this. And, and because I know the Greek and because I've looked at this, I'm going to tell you, look, you know, this is why he got upset. But even just in the regular Gre in, in the English reading, why did Peter get upset? Why was he grieved? The Bible tells us. It says in verse 17, he said unto him the third time. Now, if he's saying something different, first of all, if he's saying something different, is he saying it the third time? No, because he would say the first thing two times, and then he said something different the third time. He's saying the same thing. That's why he says the third time, but let's keep reading. To Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? It's not because he said phileo it's because he said to him the third time because he's asking him the same question three times in a row and he's already told him you know i love you that's why he's grieved that's why it's upsetting to him because he keeps asking him the same question he's saying look do you love me and if jesus is asking him the same question over and over again it's going to make you think well he's not really believing my answer because why would he keep asking me if he didn't believe me the first time that's why he gets grieved. And that's the point Jesus is trying to make. He's making a bunch of points here. But just to even further pr disprove this stupidity of, of, oh, this agape and phileo, you know, agape is a lesser love and phileo is a greater love. Okay, I looked up when those words are actually used by using the, the, you know, the Strong's um, 
dictionary and in the, in the concordance to, to find out where these words are used. So here are the verses in English. Let's look at a couple. Um, if you want to, you can flip back. We're going to be in Matthew for most of these. Flip back to Matthew 6. Um, we're going to see if this stands up. If that, that usage of agape is, is, if we apply it all throughout, because it would have to be applied. I mean, if the word means something different, right, then you should, you should be able to apply it throughout the scripture. Matthew 6, verse 5. I'm sorry, so th this is, we're, now we're looking at phileo. These are examples of phileo. This is, this is like the really intense, strong type of a love. Okay? Matthew 6, verse 5 says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets. So, that real strong, like that real emotional strong type of a love, that's how the, how the hypocrites love standing in the synagogue they're saying like that's how much they really love that it seems kind of silly to me that you would use um, if that's what that word really means i mean if it's if it's just that type of a strong thing it's so much different than agape what he's saying then would be that these hypocrites love standing in the synagogues in the corners of the streets that may be seen of men that like that's that intense love that they have now look if they say they love that, sure. Men love that because you like to, to receive the adoration. You like to receive the looks and, and, the, and you know, the accolades by people. But you're not going to convince me that they just love that so much and it's just such this strong type of a bond type of a love with something like that. You're not going to convince me that that's what that has to mean there. Matthew 23 verse 6 says a similar thing. In Matthew 23, 6, he's talking to the Pharisees, he says, And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Again, that's that real intense love that Jesus used with Peter, right? That made him so grieved is the same love of loving the uppermost rooms at feasts. So when you go to a bank, when you go to a dinner, and they give you the best room, like, Man, I love this so much! Like, this is the best thing in the whole world! I, I don't think so. I don't see that in that verse. Um, Revelation 22, 15. You don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to Matthew 22. Um, Revelation 22, 15 says, For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Again, that word phileo, that's supposed to be that really strong meaning of the word love, is used here as someone loving and making a lie. I don't know anybody that loves to lie with that type of an intensity, if that's really what that means. I mean, you could have people that, yeah, they like to lie, they like, you know, whatever, but it's to give it that type of a weight and, and say it's such a different type of a word is ridiculous. Now we're going to look in Matthew 22, verse 37. This is, these are other uses of agape. Now this is that lesser love that they say that, that Jesus was using with Peter. In verse 37 of Matthew 22, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Is there much of a stronger love than with all of your soul and with all of your heart and with all of your mind? I don't think it exists. Yet that's where they use agape. That's where they use this verse. So, in, in the last place is Luke eleven forty three says, Woe unto you Pharisees, for you love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. So in one in Matthew it's using phileo, and in Luke it's using agape for the same exact verse. The same exact thing. What does that tell you? They mean the same thing. What does that tell you? You get the same exact meaning in English that you do in Greek. They both mean love. That's the bottom line. They both mean love. And Anything, any words that might have some slight nuance or variation in a meaning, you are going to be able to infer that from the context. The context will tell you enough anyways. If there is any words that are different. I'm using, you know, agape and phileo where I think it's very easy to prove that that is not what that means. Yet, but you know what though? People use this because it preaches great, right? They could get up and they can say all this stuff and they can look so smart and people could be going there, oh, wow, yeah. You know, they, that phileo love, yeah, man, that's... And it's nonsense, okay? But people eat it up. 
It might sound good. You might have a dynamic preacher that's just really good at pulling at the pulling at the heartstrings and 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 is really you know able to keep your attention and and um, you know just has that type of a skill. Don't don't fall for that. You know, I'm not very much of a skillful preacher. You don't have to worry about that. But it, what I try to do is just provide you with the information. Okay, I present it the best way that I can, and I pray God helps me with that. But Bottom line is, is, what are the facts? What is the truth? That's what we're interested in is the truth. And you need to be able to study this out for yourself as well. Don't just take anything that you hear for granted. Don't just, just, just assume things are true because, hey, I know Pastor Burson. He's a great guy. He loves the Lord. I see what he does. And just assume that what I'm saying is always true because it may not be. People have a tendency, and, and, and I'm sure I've done it in the past, and I try not to, but I'm sure I've done it, of just repeating things that you've heard. You've got to be very careful about that, because if it's not true, now all of a sudden you're lying, and you're, and you're given false information. And especially as a pastor, when I get up to preach the Bible, I don't ever want to do that. I don't ever want to rely on things that I've just heard in the past without knowing for sure for myself, and you sitting down in the pews need to do the same thing for yourself. Okay, yes, we're here to learn. Yes, there's, there's, there's things to be learned from the Bible, but, but measure it up with God's Word, the things that I'm saying. Sure, you could learn something new. Maybe you didn't know before, but, but make sure that it's matching up with God's Word, that, that it truly is correct. And if I'm stating something that, that requires a little bit more research, look it up. Let's keep reading. We're almost done here. In... Uh, and, you know, I could go on and on on those examples with agape and phileo. I tried to really shorten it up because it's used quite a bit. I mean, the word love is in the Bible a lot. And you just start looking it up and it's just like, man. But these ones were, were just, if you don't get it from that, then you're never going to get it because those are pretty blaring examples. Let's keep reading here. We were at um, verse 17. So, yeah, so he's telling them, you know, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Like, Do you love me? And, and this is, you know, it's easy for us to say, I don't want to get off this point just yet. It's easy to say you love someone. It's easy to say it. You know, Jesus asked him, do you love me? Yeah, of course. You know I love you. I mean, yeah, I love you. What's he asking him to do? He's not asking him just to say, he says, he's asking him to do something. Okay, if you love me, like Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's one thing to tell somebody that you love them. And there's nothing wrong with telling people you love them. But what we ought to be doing is showing them that you love them. When Peter went off and, and went off fishing, he's not showing his love for Christ. When, when he was denying that he even knew Jesus, that's not showing his love. When you wanna, if you want to show that you love God, you're going you're gonna to keep his commandments. You're going you're gonna to obey and listen, and listen and do what he says. Not just hear it, not just, not just read the Bible, but put it into practice. It's one thing to hear the words. It's another thing to actually do it. And when you actually do it, that's going to show your love. Um, and you could, you could apply that concept anywhere in your life with any relationship that you have. I could apply that with my wife, with my children. You know, I could tell my wife every single day that I love her. And I don't think it's necessarily meaningless. I think it's a good thing to do to tell people you love them. But if I'm not doing anything for her, if I'm not showing and, and, and working and doing things. You know, when, it, when I go out to work, I feel like I'm showing my love for my family. I work hard. I'm going to get up early. I'm going to stay up late. And I'm going to do a lot of work to provide, to, to, to give things to you. I'm showing, that's one way to show your love. There's many other ways of doing it too. Obviously, um, you know, helping out with things. I could, I could show my love by just, oh, I see there's a mess over here. And that's her job. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna just take it on myself. I'm just gonna do this because I love her. You know, she'll see that and know that it's not just words. And this is what Jesus is saying here. Look, you can say that you love me all you want, but I want to see it. And when we're obeying God's commandments and when we're doing and fulfilling the Great Commission and the work that He has for us to do, we're showing Him our love. And think about, just think about God. Think about your relationship with God. And ask yourself this question. Do I love God? Do I really love God? And hopefully the answer is yes for everybody. But now think, okay, in my life, 
how often am I showing my love to God versus my love for the things that I like to do, like fishing or you know, playing games or doing this or doing that? How much am I really showing God my love? Can I do more? Are there more things that I can do to show Him my love? And just deal with that yourself and, and um, hopefully that will help you to get closer to God by doing more and showing your love in that way. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 18. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. So here he's explaining this, this whole, um, what he just said in verse 18, that sh he's, he's letting him know in advance how he was going to die. And the apostle Peter was crucified. Now, I've heard stories that he was crucified upside down and stuff like that. I don't know if that's true. That's, I don't see that in the scripture. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. But what it does say here in verse 18, it says, Thou shalt stretch forth thy hands. This is how we know that he was crucified because his hands were stretched out. He's going to stretch forth his hands and someone else is going to take him where you don't want to go. And that's how you know, Jesus was crucified. Well, Peter is going to be martyred and he explains that to him here. It says that when he, when he, when he had spoken thus, he said, no, follow me. So look, Peter, this is how you're going to die. But follow me. The end isn't going to be necessarily something to be looking forward to of getting crucified and hanging on a cross. But it doesn't matter. I'm telling you that now. This is the way it's going to be. You know in advance that this is coming, but what you need to do right now is follow me. He said, feed my sheep, feed my land. You need to be focused on other people. You need to be following me. And look what it says in verse 20. So, Peter hears this, but it, it, it's amazing because it still doesn't really sink into him. It says, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? So he, this is referring to John, the, the disciple that Jesus loved. And in verse 21, Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Don't get caught up about God's plan for everybody else's life but your own. Peter's looking up and saying, well, well, what about John? You know, like, Jesus just told him, you're going to be martyred and you're going you're gonna to be crucified for me. Follow me. And he says, he says well, what, what about this guy? What about that guy? Look, Jesus said, don't worry about him. He said, look, if I want him to just stay alive until I come back, what does that have to do with you, Peter? Don't worry about that. Don't worry about how he may or may not be martyred. Don't worry if he's going to live out the, you know, the next 2,000 years. That's, that doesn't matter to you. He's going to do what I want him to do, but you need to follow me. And we need to be making sure that we don't get caught up in, in just paying too much attention to what everyone else is doing instead of focusing on our own walk with God, our own walk with Christ. It's easy to get caught up and say, oh yeah, well this person, you know, they're, you know, they're doing this or they're not doing that. and Don't worry about it. I mean, if it's your brother in Christ and they're slipping and you want to help them, yeah, help them. You can worry about it in that sense. But don't worry about it in the sense that, um, you know, oh, well, God has me doing this, but what's this guy going to do? Oh, yeah. He's got, you know, he's going to have it so much nicer than me, you know, and, and have that type of a covetous attitude that we ought not to have. Um, and it's, it's funny, too, how Jesus just said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that, you know, what's, what's that your business? What does it matter what I, what I do with John? And they take those words because he says, if I will that he tarry till I come, and now all of a sudden they, they, just, they just get this, this rumor started that, oh, not, the Apostle John's not going to die because that, you know, Jesus said he's not going to die. No, it's important to, first of all, look closely at the words anytime you're reading the Bible. And because all the words matter, they're all important. And John specifies this too in verse 23. It says, Then went the saying abroad among the brethren, 
that that disciple should not die. So they're starting to say, oh, John's not going to die because Jesus said that if I will, they tarry till I come. You know, oh, so, he's, so he's not going to die. It says, yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die. So Jesus didn't say, he didn't say, John's not going to die. He explains and says, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? He didn't say it is my will. He said, but if it is, what does that matter to you? It's none of your business. And obviously that's what he meant. The Apostle John is not still walking around these days and Jesus hasn't come back yet. So it wasn't his will that John carry forth until, until he comes back. But, um, you know, it's important to read these things carefully. And in verse number 24, we'll wrap it up with this. This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So he's just, because in the last few chapters especially, John's kind of referring to himself in the third person. He's, he refers to himself even, even up earlier when it says that Peter turning about seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved. He, he's referring to himself as a disciple whom Jesus loved and, and referred to, the, to the, the feast at the supper and he leaned on his breast and asked Jesus all these things. Here we finally see that this is, you know, I am that disciple. It's me. And I, I mentioned it in, a previous, in the previous chapters that um, it was always referring to John because he's the author of this book, and he, and he lets that known here in verse 24. And then verse number 25, I love this verse, it says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. What an amazing thing to say. You think about the ministry of Jesus Christ was only three and a half years. And John gets done saying, now we got the four Gospels, we see these stories, we see the important stories that were pulled out of Jesus' ministry for us to know today. We don't know everything that he did, and one of the reasons why he says, if you were to write everything that Christ did, I don't even think the whole world can contain the volumes of books that would be written. And Jesus did a lot just in these, you know, these small referenced pages that we have here. And plenty to prove he was the Christ. He was the Son of God. But he did so much. Think about, think about the amount of work that you would have to do to have books written that the whole world can contain. Did the man ever sleep? <laughs> it makes you wonder. But that's the work ethic. He was not lazy by any means. He, he was go, 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 go. Focused on others, focused on others, doing things, miracles. I mean, everything that he did, his whole ministry was about everybody else but himself. And he did so much work. And, you know, and that's why Christianity is still around today. It's one of the reasons why. He did so many, he had so many infallible proofs that it's not just some charlatan, right? People like to say that, Oh, you know, he was just a deceiver. He tricked people. He was a you know magician or whatever. And and there were just this this small group of people that deceived so many. Not even possible. The impact that he had because of the work that he did and the testimony. It's not just the testimony of his disciples, but so many people that witnessed in this time frame when he was alive that were touched and impacted by the life of Jesus Christ in order to have done all of these miracles and all these works and all these wonders and in order for time to be based off of his birth. Right? I mean, from, from, from all of this, from, from everything, the impact that he had on this world. He was who he said he was. And um, keep that in mind about Jesus too, about how much of a hard worker he was to be able to, for the world not to contain the books that he did. Anytime that you're feeling a little lazy, anytime you're feeling like, I don't want to go out soul winning, I want to go fishing. And it, you know, when, when you have these types of attitudes. Now, again, and I've said this in the past, I don't think it's ever wrong to, to, to have a vacation 
or to, you know, to, to take a break just in general. But it shouldn't be the regular. It shouldn't be the norm. It shouldn't be like every weekend you're doing this. Every, you know, every chance you get, you're out. The focus needs to be on serving God. And I don't care who you are. It doesn't matter if you're the pastor or, or anybody. It doesn't matter. You need to be serving God. And that should be at the forefront of your life and of your existence is what can I do to serve God? Yeah, I know I need to work. I've got this job. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm supporting myself. I'm supporting my family. I'm doing the things that I need to do um, as a man in this world or you know, as a woman with, with the, the roles that the woman has to play. But I'm also serving the Lord and that's what my main focus is. That's what my goal is. And... Um, Sure, from time to time, I'm going to spend time with the family. We're going to go out and have a, have a few days and, and do some fun things. But ultimately, no, we need to be busy with the work. And you know, Jesus didn't take a vacation. I'm not going to say it's a sin to take a vacation, but, but Jesus didn't take one. So it's not, it's not something that you just need to assume is expected of, of your life, that you, you have to have this and that's owed to you or do you. But um, Let's keep that mindset. Let's do as much as we possibly can for Christ. He did the world for us. Literally. I mean, he, he, he accomplished so much. You, the world can even fill up the, the books that he's done. Let's show our love to him by doing the works and obeying his commandments and listening and putting into action what we learn from his word. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. For all that you have done for us, dear Lord, help us not to, to backslide and, and to drag others with us, dear Lord. And if we notice someone else starting to backslide, God, help us to just have the strength and the courage to be able to just um, help that brother or sister get back on track by doing things that are going to be, um, you know, saying something that's going to be edifying to them in, in love, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just continue to teach us that we could know more about your, your word and your commandment, that we can continue to follow them and obey them. Dear Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.